It's umsum time. How do electron microscopes work? Wait, I know what a telescope is, but what is a microscope? <laughs> oh, umsum. To buy umsum merchandise, visit umsum.com. <laughs> Scanning electron microscopes are used to produce very sharp 3D images by scanning the surface of extremely tiny objects. Hmm. A scanning electron microscope consists of an electron gun. Once the object to be scanned is placed, this gun is used to shoot a focused electron beam at it. Scanning electron microscope consists of a series of electromagnetic coils. These coils can pull the electron beam back as well as forth. They systematically scan the entire surface of the object. This electron beam does not pass through the object, rather it is reflected off its surface. These reflected electrons or secondary electrons are directed at a cathode ray TV screen. The image of the scanned object is formed on this screen. This is how a scanning electron microscope works. Hmm. How do electromagnets work? Simple. They work because they have a magnetic personality like me. Oh, I'm some. The construction of an electromagnet is very simple. A conductive wire, usually made of copper, is wrapped around a piece of metal. In this case, iron. Now, with the help of a battery, a current is introduced. This current starts flowing through the coiled wire, resulting in the creation of a magnetic field. This magnetic field magnetizes the iron metal, thus resulting in the creation of an electromagnet. An electromagnet is similar to a magnet. It has two poles. Like poles repel each other while opposites attract. Hmm. It is also able to attract iron filings. Hmm. The only difference is that the magnetism is not permanent. Once the current is removed, magnetism may stop working suddenly or after some time. Hmm. An electric bell is a good example of the use of an electromagnet. <laughs> hmm. How does a 3D printer work? Simple. Mix 3 and D and you get a 3D printer. Oh, <laughs> I'm some. A 3D printer uses a method called fused deposition modeling. In this method, a 3D model is printed from the bottom up, one layer at a time, by repeatedly printing over the same area. Hmm. First, a 3D CAD drawing is fed to the printer. The 3D printer divides the 3D drawing into two-dimensional, cross-sectional layers. These layers are basically like separate 2D prints which sit on the top of one another. The only difference is that there is no paper in between. Now, if we were to use ink to print them, it would not be possible to get the volume necessary to build a 3D model. Hence, instead of ink, the 3D printer may use molten plastic. The molten plastic is fused together using an adhesive or ultraviolet light. Hmm. How does an electric fuse work? It doesn't work. It is kept there just for fun. <laughs> oh, I'm some. An electric fuse is a safety device. It helps avoid short circuits and thus helps in protecting the electrical appliances from getting damaged. Hmm. A fuse consists of a metal strip or a wire fuse element. When current starts flowing through the fuse element, heat is generated due to resistance of the fuse element. The fuse element is constructed in such a fashion that when normal current flows or a small current spike occurs, it does not cause the fuse element to attain a high temperature. But when the current load is too high, the fuse element rises to a high temperature and melts thus breaking the circuit and, in turn, saving the electrical appliance from damage. Hmm. How do huh? batteries work? That is a secret. I can't tell anyone. Ooh, I'm <laughs> some. A battery works by converting chemical energy into electricity. A battery consists of one or more electrochemical cells. An electrochemical cell consists of two electrodes separated by an electrolyte. When the battery's two electrodes are connected into a circuit, the negatively charged electrons start flowing through the external wire. 
while the positively charged ions start flowing through the electrolyte. This balancing of charge is important to keep the reaction running. Now, this flow of electrons through the external wire is basically electricity. It allows us to power our devices. This is how batteries work. Hmm. Also, there exists a semi-permeable barrier in the electrolyte so that huh? all the ions do not immediately coat the electrode and thus clog the system. Hmm. How does an electric bell work? No idea. I did not invent it. Oh, I'm um, some. An electric bell consists of a bell, an electromagnet, switch, battery, clapper, and a coil. When the switch is closed and electric current passes from the battery to the electromagnet, this leads to the creation of a magnetic field. This magnetic field attracts the iron arm of the clapper. As a result, the metal ball strikes and we hear a sound. Hmm. Now, this movement of the arm also leads to the opening of electrical contacts. This interrupts the current to the electromagnet and causes collapse of the magnetic field, causing the clapper to move away from the bell. Now, this movement of the arm leads to the closing of the electrical contacts again. Thus, the cycle starts repeating itself. As it repeats rapidly, we hear <laughs> continuous ringing. This is how an electric bell works. Hmm. How does a light bulb glow? Simple. It glows because of um sum's brightness. Oh, um sum. <laughs> A light bulb glows because of the principle of conversion of energy, which states that energy is converted from one form to another. In this case, electrical energy is converted to heat plus light. Let us see how this happens. When we switch on the bulb, electricity starts flowing. This electricity, or the flow of electrons, is hindered by the filament of the bulb. The filament is usually made of tungsten, as it has a high melting point. A long and thin filament wire offers higher resistance to the flow of electrons. Hmm. Now this hindrance to the flow of electrons leads to the creation of friction, which causes the filament to heat up and start glowing. So this is how a light bulb glows. Hmm. How does huh? a pulse oximeter work? Shh. It is a secret. Oh, I'm some. <laughs> Pulse oximetry is a test carried out using a pulse oximeter. This test is used to measure the oxygen level in our blood. Hmm. Hemoglobin is a protein present in our red blood cells. It transports oxygen from lungs to cells in our body. Pulse oximetry is based on the principle that oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin differentially absorb red and infrared light. Hmm. Oxygenated hemoglobin absorbs greater amounts of infrared light and lower amounts of red light as compared to deoxygenated hemoglobin. Hmm. Now, a pulse oximeter has LEDs which emit red as well as infrared light. These lights pass through our finger and are detected by a photodiode on the opposite end. Finally, by measuring changes in the light absorption, a pulse oximeter is able to give us the oxygen level in our blood. Hmm. How does an air conditioner work? Simple. I blink and it starts working. Oh, I'm um, some. <laughs> an air conditioner has three main parts. Firstly, evaporator, which is located inside the house. Hmm. Finally, compressor and a condenser, which are usually located outside. Hmm. When hot air from the room flows over the cold, low-pressure evaporator coils, the liquid refrigerant, which is present inside the coils, absorbs this heat and starts getting converted to gaseous state. Now, this gaseous refrigerant passes through the compressor, which puts it under high pressure and converts it back to liquid state. The extra heat which is generated during this process is let out using the condenser coils and an outdoor fan. This cycle keeps on repeating itself. This is how an air conditioner works and our <laughs> rooms remain cool. Hmm. How does water get inside a coconut? Simple. I put it inside using magic. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Firstly, roots of the coconut plant absorb water from the soil by a process called osmosis. This water is then transported to different parts of the coconut plant. Some of it reaches the coconut. 
The liquid, which eventually reaches the coconut, is referred to as the endosperm. The endosperm acts as the food or nourishment for the coconut's growth. Now, a part of the endosperm gets converted into a creamy tissue and gets deposited on the coconut's inner surface. Over a period of time, this creamy tissue turns hard and the remaining endosperm ends up as coconut water. So this is how water ends up inside a coconut.